This is an excerpt of a recent Power Up webinar entitled Ask Larry Anything. Hi, my name is Larry Jordan. In this short video tutorial, I'll explain what affects computer system performance for video editing, what can slow down your data, and what speeds we should expect from our gear. Apple's been bragging about their new high-end Mac Studio, a computer that I love myself and I'm looking forward to buying the first quarter of next year. But they have two broad categories, the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra. One's got 10-core CPU, the other's 20. One's got 24-core GPU, and the other's got 48. And they have neural engines. I mean, how do we decide? Now, in the past, video editing was the hardest thing we could do on our computer. But computers kept getting faster and kept getting faster. And now video editing isn't pushing our computers as hard as we thought it was. Well, how hard is it pushing our computers? Well, I'm running right now on an M1 Pro, not the Max, not the Ultra. It's a MacBook Pro laptop, 16-inch, and I decided to do some tests. So I fired up the latest version of Final Cut Pro, and, and I said, how, how many CPUs does it use for playback? And you can see that it's using 108% of my CPUs. Now, this sounds like a lot, except each, each CPU counts as 100%. So if I have 10 CPUs, that's 1,000% if all of my CPUs were busy. And you can see during playback, I was all the CPUs are just sort of kicking back, having a good time. The two on the left, by the way, are the efficiency cores. The eight on the right are the high processing, high performance cores. Well, let's look down at rendering. When I'm rendering an, uh, an Apple ProRes 4x4 project, an unusual size, 1600 by 900, which is my webinar. CPUs were even less busy. And notice that the bulk of the rendering was not done on the high performance cores, but on the two high efficiency cores. Well, how about exporting? Well, even less. It uses 18%. And most of the CPU cores are not used at all. And look at how much data it's reading. We think about we need to have an SSD for the, to be able to handle the vast majority of data coming out of Final Cut, but it's writing less than 100 megabytes a second. Now, granted, this is not a 2K project or a 4K project, and these numbers will go up some. But what struck me was how little of the CPU power was being used. Hmm. So let me check Premiere. If I look at Premiere, Premiere is principally using just the two efficiency cores for playback and barely getting them to exercise. Rendering, processing 120 megabytes a second, but still only principally using the efficiency cores. It wasn't until we got to export that we started to see some significant activity on the high performance cores. Those are the ones excluding the two on the left. But even so, it's not outputting that much data. It's still less than 100 megabytes a second. Now, I don't know DaVinci Resolve as well as I should, and I really don't know how to get it to render. And it wasn't really important for me to look at all the different features in Resolve. So I looked at what processors it used to build the waveform display, just the efficiency cores, and so little of the CPU that it doesn't even hit 10%. Playback uses 48%, again, the efficiency cores. At export, again, it's writing faster than Final Cut, 170 megabytes of reading and 83 writing, but not pushing the CPUs so far. If we take a look at this in the big picture, this is only a 1600 by 900 30 frame ProRes 4x4 project. It's not 2K, it's not 4K. But it's also not pushing the CPUs very hard, and neither of these applications are leveraging all the high-performance cores. Which tells me that if I bought the top-end Ultra, most of those CPUs are not going to be used. I find that fascinating. So I did some more digging. Here's an example of specific RAID speeds for various combinations, and how you format the RAID makes a difference. For instance, if you only have one drive, let's assume it goes at 150 megabytes a second. Two formatted as RAID 0 is 300 meg. 
But there's no redundancy. If you lose a drive, you've lost everything, unless it's backed up to a different unit. If you format it as RAID 1, RAID 1 is mirroring, where both drives have the same data. So therefore, if one drive dies, all the data is safely stored on the other. It does give us redundancy, but gives us the speed and capacity of a single drive. Generally, if you have a two-drive system, RAID 0 makes the most sense, but you need to make sure you've got room to back that up somewhere else. A four-drive RAID, RAID 0, would be 600 megs a second. Again, maximum speed, maximum capacity, but no data redundancy. A RAID 1 is always the size and speed of a single drive, even if you have more. So if you've got a four-drive RAID, RAID 1 is just wasting your money. Formatting it as RAID 5 gives us the most speed, the most capacity with redundancy, and it guarantees that if one drive dies, all our data is safe. RAID 6 allows us to lose two drives at the same time and still protect our data, but speed drops and capacity drops. RAID 10, which is a favorite format for some, takes and requires an even number of drives in a RAID, takes half the drives and formats them as RAID 0, the other half of the drive formats as RAID 0, and then combines those two storage pools in RAID 1 so that they mirror each other. The good news is all your data is safely backed up, and if one drive dies, you've got the other side, but look at how much of a hit you're taking in terms of performance and in terms of capacity. I recommend RAID 5 to make the most out of the money you're spending on the RAID. If we look at the same numbers for eight drives, um, it, this concept is the same for six. We get the maximum speed with no redundancy with RAID 0, the maximum performance with RAID 5 with data redundancy, and a significant fall off in speed and capacity as we go to RAID 6 or RAID 10. So when you're formatting RAIDs that have spinning hard drives in them, formatting them as RAID 5 maximizes your investment, gives you the best speed with the deepest capacity with redundancy in case you lose a drive. Well, if we switch to SSD RAIDs, SSDs are far faster, which means we don't need as many SSD blades in the unit as we do hard drives in a spinning drive RAID. There's two types of SSDs, SATA and NVMe. A SATA RAID transfers data around 400 megabytes a second. An NVMe SSD transfers data around 2,500 megabytes a second. If we take a two-drive NVMe RAID, we can configure it RAID 0 or RAID 1, same as an, an HDD RAID. RAID 0 is the fastest. RAID 1 provides redundancy. But notice the yellow flags, okay? The yellow flag says that combining that NVMe RAID into a RAID 0 is faster than can be supported by Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4, because Thunderbolt 3 or 4 max out at 2850, and combining these as a RAID 0 exceeds that. If we look at a 4-drive NVMe RAID, RAID 0, 10,000 megabytes per second, not supported by Thunderbolt in a, at all. RAID 1, again, is the speed of a single drive and makes no sense if you have more than two SSD blades in your external storage. RAID 4, and RAID 4 is the recommended configuration for SSD RAIDs, the way that, read, that RAID 5 is recommended for hard drive RAIDs. RAID 4 gives us the greatest speed and the greatest capacity, but again, it exceeds the transfer rate of Thunderbolt. The reason you get an HDD RAID is you want faster performance. The reason you get an SSD RAID is you are given the fast performance. What you're adding now is greater capacity because SSDs don't hold the same amount of data that a spinning hard drive does. But in both cases, there's going to be limitations in both the speed and data redundancy of the device you create based upon how that is put together with the number of blades or drives and the way that they're formatted, the RAID level that they use. 
This was an excerpt of a recent Power Up webinar called Ask Larry Anything. For the complete version of this training, please visit my store at larryjordan.com slash store and look for Webinar 342. By the way, when you need to stretch your training dollars, membership in our video training library saves you money and time. You can access all our videos for a low monthly price of only $19.99, almost 2,000 movies, hundreds of hours on a wide variety of subjects. Plus, premium members can download practice media and projects. Our training covers a variety of software, and we update it multiple times each month. For more information, visit LarryJordan.com slash membership. And thanks.